Religious Studies Department, and it is my absolute joy to introduce our three fabulous speakers today, um, who will be speaking as part of our panel, Jews, Gender, and Difference in the U.S. Armed Forces, uh, which is the second in a two-part series um, uh, commemorating Veterans Day, looking at the engagement of Jews in the U.S. military. So I'm going to introduce, I'll introduce them in the order um, in which they'll speak. They'll speak for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have time for all of your questions, so get them ready. Um, so I'm going to start with Jessica Guffman. Jessica is the Director of Jewish Studies and an Associate Professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Muhlenberg College in Allentown, Pennsylvania. She teaches courses on modern Jewish history and culture, religion in the United States, and religion and violence. Her research focuses on American Judaism and American Jewish history. And her book, Making Judaism Safe for America, World War I and the Origins of Religious Pluralism, is hot off the NYU Press, uh, published in October 2018. She's beginning work now on a new project, examining sites of Jewish-Christian interfaith engagement and is particularly interested in Christian and interfaith past member states. Our next speaker will be our very own uh, Kirsten from English. Uh, Kirsten is Associate Professor of History and Jewish Studies at Michigan State University. She is the author of A Rosenberg by Any Other Name, A History of Jewish Name Changing in America, which was also published by Edwin <laughs> Press. Also this last month. That's right. I've been very Her previous publications <laughs> include American Dreams and Nazi Nightmares in 2006 and the Norton Critical Edition of Betty Friedan, The Feminine Mystique in 2013. She's also the co-editor of the journal American Jewish History. And last but certainly not least, Ronique Westall is Assistant Professor of History at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, she's the author of Enlisting Faith. <laughs> they're all for sale. <laughs> if anybody wants to buy them, they're all for sale. <laughs> after, after that. Um, Enlisting Faith, How the Military Chaplaincy Shaped Religion and State in Modern America. She's also written co columns for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, and the Forward. Previously, she held postdoctoral fellowships in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania and the Dan Paul Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis. She earned her PhD in history from the um, some, some university in Ann Arbor. <laughs> um, the University of Michigan in 2014. Um, please join me in welcoming our panelists. All right, so I'll start. Thank you all for coming so much. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'll be talking about Jewish images of Jewish masculinity in the World War I American Expeditionary Forces. And I'm a, I don't know, boring speaker, so I, I have a sort of prepared speech, but we can feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. Um, I'm not entirely boring as a human, just as a speaker. <laughs> in 1917, Jacob Rader Marcus was an enlisted man in the U.S. Army. He was still a few years away from rabbinical ordination and many years away from his career as one of the preeminent historians of American Jewish life, but he was already a keen and skeptical observer of Jews in the American military. It seems, he wrote in the diary he kept throughout his life, that there is bound to be prejudice all the time between Jews and non-Jews. Sometimes, he wrote, though, those poor Yehudas brought it upon themselves by behaving in ways that seem strange to other men, by making it appear that Jews were conspiring to help each other, or simply by appearing weak. About one such Jew, Marcus wrote, quote, that Egg Baumgarten is a mighty poor Yehuda. He's always around when there are privileges for Jews, especially passes. You'll often find men of his type. On another occasion, Marcus commented, Sergeant told me in a whisper that the whole company raised hell when they heard a Jew was going to come into their outfit but they soon found that he was a good kid. No commentary needed. Jew, no good, pariah. Know him, find he's honorable and true and capable. I wonder what they think of me. They tell me these things. Maybe I'm one of those Jews who are not really Jews. Nearly 250,000 Jewish men served in the World War I American military, and their presence among the troops created an unprecedented opportunity to show the country that Jewish men could live up to American masculine ideals, as well as to teach the poor Yehudas among them that real Jews could still be real men. The Jewish Welfare Board, or JWB, was the agency charged with cultivating the characters of Jewish soldiers. Through its work in the US government's newly created Soldiers Welfare Program, it sought to demonstrate not only that Jewish men could embody the ideas of American manhood, 
but that adherence to Judaism was the best way to assure that they lived up to those American ideals. The JWB envisioned the Jewish soldier as a man who could dispel anti-Jewish stereotypes and embrace the best of being an American while remaining loyal to his Jewish heritage. It hoped to use a program of educational, recreational, and spiritual services for soldiers to create a generation of proud Jewish men who felt perfectly at home among their non-Jewish compatriots while advancing a new model of American Jewish masculinity. The JWB pursued this work as part of a government experiment in social engineering. Concerned about protecting both the morale and the morals of the young men in the American Expeditionary Forces, U.S. Secretary of War Newton Baker um, ordered the creation of a program of wholesome, uplifting activities intended to keep soldiers and sailors sober, sexually restrained, and out of trouble during their training and after they shipped out for service in France. But he aspired to do more. The U.S. War Department hoped to use its soldiers' welfare program to improve the moral and physical quality of American soldiers and through them to improve American citizenry as a whole. The government lacked the staff or resources to run its soldiers' welfare programs on its own. So during the war, it chose to outsource much of the actual work to religiously-based civilian organizations, most prominently the Protestant Young Men's Christian Association, or YMCA, the Knights of Columbus, a Catholic fraternal order, and the newly established Jewish Welfare Board. These three organizations were appointed as representatives of the government in the project of shaping the characters and protecting the morals of young American men. The War Department promised that the soldiers' welfare services would be conducted on a non-sectarian basis, but in reality, each of these groups pursued distinctly sectarian missions and offered models of manly behavior and comportment that reflected their own goals and concerns. The YMCA used its position in an attempt to extend an evangelizing Protestant mission to the soldiers. The Knights of Columbus <coughs> and the Jewish Welfare Board worked to defend their boys from YMCA proselytization while enhancing their sense of Catholic and Jewish religious distinctiveness. The JWB set out to ensure that Jewish men lived up to the same models of masculine behavior that the War Department hoped to inspire in all of its soldiers but that they did so through a renewed connection to Judaism, rather than exposure to the evangelical message of the YMCA. In a 1918 article, JWB spokesman Rabbi David DeSola Poole explained, the prime purpose of our work is to help the morale of the army by preserving among our own men ethical and religious values and the finer aspects of personality. This means stimulating all that is Jewish in our men. To bring, expression, to bring to expression the depths of personality in the individual soldier. It was through exposure to Jewish influences, the JWB argued, that Jewish men could be made to appreciate the finest values of American civilization. JWB representatives in military camps thus received suggestions for holiday celebrations and Sabbath services that made the alignment of Jewish and American values clear. One memo from JWB headquarters, for example, paralleled Abraham's migration from the land of his fathers to the story of Roger Williams founding Rhode Island, or compared the sacrifice of Isaac to both the, quote, implicit obedience of his soldier and efforts to abolish child labor. In each of these suggestions, the JWB sought to dictate the values reflected in the religious services held in the military and to demonstrate the connection between Judaism and American democracy. The JWB distributed pamphlets for soldiers, which even argued that Judaism provided the model for American democracy. The pamphlet entitled Golden Rule Hillel paralleled the life of the Jewish sage Rabbi Hillel with that of Abraham Lincoln and drew a connection between Hillel's legal rulings and the development of American law. As the pamphlet explained, poor and proud, Hillel supported himself by manual labor while he was securing his education. Like Abraham Lincoln, he was a woodchopper. Hillel's career is a shining example of the democratic principle which has always prevailed in Jewish life, of the opportunity open to all men of talents, however humble in their origin, to achieve a position in the Republic of Jewish learning. And then it goes on to talk about how this is the basis for the Constitution and the English common law. The JWB sought, moreover, to embody the connection it drew between Judaism and Americanism through its selection of JWB workers. It looked for representatives
representatives who could put a polished, educated, unaccented American face on the Judaism found in American military camps and reflect the sort of American masculinity that the JWB claimed were the result of Jewish influences. The JWB um, sought workers as guardians of the good name of the Jewish people and sent them to monitor and improve the behavior of Jewish soldiers, handling incidents of Jewish misbehavior quickly with tact and discretion and smoothing the path to a future in which Jews and Christians could embrace each other as fellow Americans. Careful consideration then had to be given to the type of men chosen as JWB workers in order to assure that they made the right impression among the Jewish and the non-Jewish soldiers that they encountered. The JWB preferred to hire men who were born in the United States, spoke unaccented English, and reflected the type of masculine identity it wished to project and promote for all Jewish men. In personal correspondence, board members carefully discussed their concerns about the appearances and accents of their field workers. In letters to JWB Chairman Harry Cutler, Acting President of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America and JWB board member Cyrus Adler took careful note of the type of impression certain applicants created. David Aronson, who is a student at the seminary, Adler wrote of one applicant who went on to become a conservative rabbi and the president of the conservative rabbinical assembly. Uh, Adler continues, Mr. Teller tells me he does not, in his opinion, quite measure up physically and in some other ways for the work. He may be right about this, as Aronson is a rather unhappy looking individual. With regard to Spitz, he wrote about another applicant, I would say that Mr. Brickner's memorandum that he has a lisp and a foreign accent are correct. He's not the type of man I would pick. The selection of JWB field workers depended on a variety of factors. The board valued Jewish education and experience working with young men, but evaluations of workers suggested that good looks, physical prowess, and an appearance and accent that fell in line with American ideals of masculinity mattered a great deal. Without these qualities, the JWB worried that the worker would fail to embody the harmony between Americanism and Judaism that it touted and as a result would fail to serve as the sort of model for Jewish masculinity that it wanted to display. Rabbi Bernard Ehrenreich spearheaded JWB efforts in Montgomery, Alabama. In a letter to JWB headquarters, Ehrenreich expe expressed his concern about camp workers and their appearance and bearing in strong terms. He wrote, another matter is confidential and I do not wish it divulged. Mr. Gordon is very anxious to come to Montgomery as my assistant. I regard him very highly, but as his personal appearance, his manner, and methods are not what I would expect from a man working among military men, I want you to stay him off from Montgomery. I want an American of college breeding with pep, tact, and willingness to work regardless of the hours. You know what I mean. No others need apply. This is between you and me. Mum's the word. It's too bad he left his papers in the archives. <laughs> Aaron Rice's concerns found a ready audience at the JWB where board members desired that their organization and American Jewry as a whole be represented by workers who looked the part of well-read, well-spoken American men. The JWB strove to project a form of Judaism that would make non-Jewish men feel welcome, confident that Jewish values closely resembled their own, and that Jewish soldiers could be trusted as fellow Americans and comrades in arms. This desire perhaps explains the enthusiasm surrounding the story of Chaplain Elkin Borsanger, the first Jewish military chaplain in France. Dubbed the fighting rabbi, the JWB celebrated Borsanger as an ideal representative of American Jews. Borsanger was ordained at the Reform Seminary, Hebrew Union College, in 1914. When the United States entered the war, he gave up his clergy exemption and resigned his position as an assistant rabbi in St. Louis to enter the army as an enlisted man. He went to France with his unit, but after Congress authorized the appointment of Jewish chaplains, Borsanger became the first rabbi to receive such a commission. He was eventually promoted to senior captain of the 77th Division and earned a French Croix de Guerre and a Purple Heart during his ser service. In a retrospective piece in the American Hebrew, uh, Borsanger was described as living in the trenches, sharing their hard tack and bully beef, over the top with his men at dawn. He was one of the boys in every sense of the word. A figure of powerful physique, forceful personality, military bearing, and yet in his intercourse with the men, one of dominant spirituality, calling forth an evident response wherever a kindred fear feeling was innermost hidden. 
that was the figure in the sand-colored Ford which rode up the lines where Shell whizzed most often and made its owners known and loved by every doughboy in the vicinity. Depictions of Vorsanger perfectly reflected the image that the JWB hoped to project. Strong, dignified, unafraid, one of the boys, able to connect with all soldiers. His dominant spirituality al allowed him to draw forth the hidden feelings of the men, but did not set him apart from them. His title of rabbi served as proof of his pride in being Jewish, but did not interfere with his ability to connect meaningful, meaningfully with all the soldiers under his charge. Rather than speak of him as a rabbi possessed of piety or learning, he was portrayed as a man possessing the manners, tact, and common touch that made him a real American. His role in the military was defined by his Jewishness, but his bond with the men was based on his physique, personality, and military bearing. As Jewish role models, JWB workers focused on using a combination of religious, educational, athletic, and recreational programs to raise the morale, build the characters, and instill high moral standards in the men under its care. They encouraged unambiguous expressions of American patriotism from all soldiers and urged them to remember their obligation to behave honorably even as they trained for the trenches. The Welfare Board Sentinel, a magazine published and distributed in U.S. military camps by the JWB, um, included uh, Rabbi William Rosenau's Ten Commandments for the Soldiers in its first issue and urge readers to remember that these commandments were, quote, well worth memorizing by every welfare board worker as well as by every soldier. They are. First commandment, I am America, thy country, which brought thee out of bondage to liberty. Second, thou shalt have no other country beside me. Three, thou shalt not take the name of America, thy country, in vain. Four, remember the Declaration of Independence and keep it holy. Five, honor thy superior officers. Six, thou shalt not despoil. Seven, thou shalt not ravish. Eight, thou shalt not loot. Nine, thou shalt not betray. Ten, thou shalt not annex. In these new commandments, the United States assumed divine status, displacing God and sacred texts as the ultimate source of freedom and righteousness um, and good male behavior. Nothing about these Ten Commandments differentiated Jewish men from their compatriots. All were admonished to put country first and to behave in accordance with the very highest standards of American manhood. As American servicemen, their primary responsibility lay in upholding their country's goals and standards rather than in any separate religious tradition or community. The Commandments conveyed standards of loyalty and behavior expected of all American soldiers, but they also revealed anxieties about areas where JWB officials feared that Jewish soldiers needed to be reminded of what honor and duty demanded of them. The first commandment surely spoke to concerns about the 18% of all American soldiers and possibly as many as one third of all Jewish soldiers who had been born in other countries. With anti-immigrant hostility on the rise, JWB commandments instructed men to be sure that they put the United States first and treated their country and its founding tenets with reverence. Other commandments focused on personal behavior. The JWB's commandments stressed the need for honesty, loyalty, self-control, discipline, and particularly sexual restraint. Reminders to avoid acts of violence against civil, uh, civilians like looting, ravishing, and despoiling indicated both the era's assumption that men, men's nature drew them to such acts and an admonition to remember that all civilized American men mastered and resisted such urges. While these commandments presume to set standards of behavior applicable to all servicemen, many other JWB policies focus on Jewish men in particular. They promise that the honorable behavior of each Jewish soldier would reflect well on American Jews as a whole, but stress that a failure to live up to ideal American standards might indicate that Judaism could not, in fact, contribute to the moral welfare of the military or country as effectively as the JWB claims. JWB representatives, therefore, had to persuade Jewish soldiers to behave themselves. In a letter distributed by the, a letter distributed by the JWB advised, the camp workers should try to influence the men by tactful talks to live clean lives and keep, keep morally straight. The workers should keep in friendly touch with the officers so as to create sympathetic interest in the welfare work and a fair attitude towards Jewish men. The workers should also aim to further and emphasize goodwill between the Jewish units and their non-Jewish confreres. 
The Jewish Welfare Board expected its workers to be diligent promoters of goodwill between Jewish and non-Jewish men, working preemptively to encourage harmony and friendship between Jews and other Americans. Friendship and relationships of mutual respect between Jews and Christians would offer proof of the Jewish soldiers' equal embodiment of American ideals and were thus highly desirable, except in one area, where the JWB actively sought to set Jewish soldiers apart from other men, relationships with women. All of the welfare agencies, as well as the Commission on Training Camp Activities that they worked under, stressed the need for soldiers to exercise sexual restraint and limit their contact with loose women. But while the War Department hoped to prevent the debilitating spread of venereal disease among the troops, the JWB approached its own attempts to keep the men away from inappropriate women with an additional concern in mind, the threat of intermarriage. Ooh, I have more than I thought. All right, I'll just skip. Intermarriage rates among American Jews were extremely low in this part of the 20th century, but JWB workers did encounter situations where soldiers fell in love with uh, a non-Jewish woman or a non-Jewish soldier fell in love with a, Jew a local um, non-Jewish woman and the, or Jewish man uh, and turned to the JWB worker for advice. Um, the JWB thus published a pamphlet entitled Intermarriage and sent off at least 20,000 copies to distribute among soldiers. In the pamphlet, the author, Rabbi David DeSola Poole, abandoned his earlier arguments about the ways that Jewish men were the same as other Americans, and argued instead that there were fundamental differences between Jew and non-Jew which lurk beneath the surface, watching and working for the opportunity which friction brings to break through and aggravate any discord which may arise in a home based on the union of Jew and Gentile. This race feeling, he warned, had nothing to do with religion or practice and remained equally present in the most and least religious Jew. Um, latent feeling, he wrote, though perhaps no, not known to either husband or wife, um, will always sort of undermine the marriage. According to the Sola Pool, a Jewish man could never truly build a home with a Christian woman. They might marry, but a Christian wife could never create the sort of uplifting Jewish home that would lead her husband to the high moral standards expected of him as a Jew or an American. She would always be tied to a faith and a race foreign to her husband and would never be able to imbue their, home, imbue their home with the Jewish spirit he needed to make him a better man and a better citizen. Worse still, the Sola Pool claim, willingness to intermarry and give up the uplifting influence of Judaism indicated a fatal flaw in the character of the man. He explained, no man worthy of the name will with, uh, without further thought enter into a union which he knows will mean a lifelong sorrow to his parents and which may result in a complete break between him and the father and mother who have given him life. The man who will be untrue to his people and its ideal and will desert it in its hour of need is one who the conscience of Jewry rightly excludes from fellowship, equality, and honor. The JWB celebrated the possibilities that military service and welfare work created for Jewish and non-Jewish men to form meaningful bonds based on their shared sense of Americanness, but it did not view relationships between Jewish men and non-Jewish women in the same way. For Jusola Pool and the JWB, marriage marked the boundary of where Jewish men differed from American norms and from their non-Jewish compatriots. If Jewish men needed Judaism in order to fulfill their potential as soldiers and citizens, then the JWB argued Jewish marriages needed to be preserved as a vital and separate source of Jewish identity. Without Judaism, men would, men would lose the moral compass they needed to make sound choices, not only about women, but about the sort of men they would be during their time in the military and long after. Marriage, it seems, was the crucial spot at which Jewish masculinity needed to resist American models in order to survive. According to the JWB, Shaping a new model of American Jewish masculinity required carefully crafted religious instruction, appropriate male role models, and the creation of Jewish homes and Jewish families. Working with the World War I US military, the JWB hoped to have a unique chance to once and for all turn all those poor Yehudas into real American Jewish families. <laughs> Okay. All right. 
Um, all right, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, so we're sort of doing this in order. Uh, Jessica just spoke about World War I, and I'm going to speak about World War II. Uh, my book <laughs> is on name changing throughout the 20th century, um, and so this is a piece of it um, uh, that looks at World War II, which is really a turning point in name changing. Um, and so what I have is sort of a piece that talks um, about sort of the ways that World War II is kind of a really crucial moment for name changing. It really sparks, um, or it really is kind of the height of name changing for Jews in New York City at this moment. Um, and actually, interestingly, I was saying, I asked this to be about gender, um, but it's really about men and women doing it equally. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is just the reasons that Jews do it, but as I do it, you'll see that it's both men and women doing it, which is unusual, actually, um, and is a change that, that World War II sort of engineers. And so, as I talk, I'm gonna talk about why people are doing it in great numbers in World War II, and it's important to know that it's men and women doing it, and I think that actually is a significant gender change. Um, okay, and I'm also going to be Try and do, uh, try, try and try and um, sort of break off sometimes without going over time. So in 1943, the film Baton. Wait, it's not there yet. There we go. Um, in 1943, the film Baton famously introduced the members of its doomed American squadron by name. So it has all the soldiers up there in the scene, you know, calling out their name, and it does so to highlight the diverse and democratic nature of the American nation. Um, it's like the most famous of Hollywood movies if you've ever seen this, but it uses the characters' names. Each character comes from a different ethnic background. Um, you know, so they, Alfred Aaron Rosenthal, Antonio Espatoya, William Schick, right? It purposely uses these, these different ethnic names, um, and there's always a Jewish guy before them. Um, and they, they use these films to highlight American tolerance and really to establish the democratic credentials of the nation's fighting forces, um, and by extension, the nation itself. And this is being done by filmmakers, it's being done by individual filmmakers, but they're also, their work is being monitored um, and promoted by the Office of War Information, so the federal government. So it's both privately, it's being done privately, but it's also being sort of monitored and censored by the government, um, which is both encouraging filmmakers to do this and also censoring them when they don't do it. Um, to show the ways that the nation is made stronger by its reliance on many different men from a wide range of ethnic backgrounds who are all committed to the common cause of democracy and they're all supported by official policies, policies of tolerance. Um, and you see this kind of use of names as a way of sort of, as like a shorthand to talk about democracy and tolerance in lots of different places in World War II. So this is a poster that comes out, um, again, sort of pushed by Office of War Information. Um, and it is also, it is actually being pushed by, um, by uh, the government in pushing its, um, its uh, uh, um, policies of hiring. Um, it, uh, after they sort of in, insisted that um, there be no discrimination in hiring, and that's where the quotation comes from from Franklin Roosevelt as the executive order that insists that there be no discrimination in military hiring. But you can see again that the visual um, is using names, right? Um, I, the Polish name at the top, Cohen, which I'm not gonna be able to pronounce, um, Cohen, Lazari, Santini, Williams, Kelly, right? It's all these use of names in order to be able to talk about democracy. Um, and you can see, this is just another example from um, the cartoonist, um, Carrie Orr and the Chicago Tribune, um, Descendants of Many Lands, Fighting for America, Their Country, and you can see the same trope over and over again, although the, Jew, the Jewish names over there on the side, Cohen, but O'Hara, and lots of right. So you can see that this is kind of a, this is kind of a, a trope, <coughs> sort of something that people keep existing upon at this time. Public discourse, both governmental and private, right, these are private cartoonists, um, during World War II clearly used the existence of diverse men's names as a key symbol of ethnic difference in America, and by extension, the, the tolerance of democracy that America represented. Um, but ironically, um, uh, diverse male names also came to symbolize intolerance in America during World War II, also through both governmental and private ways. So this is a poem, a little, um, like a pamphlet that you might find on a subway platform or that might get stuck into your mail um, if you were a soldier. Um, it was reprinted in newsletters. First American killed in Pearl Harbor, John J. Hennessy. First pilot to sink a Jap ship. Um, ex excuse me for the like, racial slur from the time. Colin P. Kelly. First American to sink a Jap ship with a torpedo, John P. Buckley. Greatest American air hero, Rich O'Hare. First American killed in Guadalcanal, John J. O'Brien. First American to get four new tires, Abraham Lipschitz. 
Um, so this was common. You would see it all the time. This was the most popular anti-Semitic poem circulated in the United States during the war. It was published in military publications as well as in civilian journals all over the country. Um, and the names varied in different versions, as did the accomplishments. It was not always the exact same poem. Um, but the last line always describes someone who was profiteering from the war, right? The last line is somebody, everybody else has done some kind of heroic event, and the last guy is the guy who gets tires, which nobody else can get during the war, right? That's, that's like nobody else can get actually born your tires. And that's always a Jewish name, right? A name that's kind of identified as a Jewish name. Um, the American Jewish Committee, which was like a defense organization for Jews, reported that this was published in official um, naval and Coast Guard newspapers in Hawaii and Tennessee and California. It was published in civilian journals at defense industry plants, so still associated with the federal government because they're producing the tanks and the ammunition for the war from, in plants from Massachusetts to Illinois to Oregon. And Jewish defense, I mean, Jewish men are furious when they see this in their second, right? Because, you know, it's a joke, right? But the joke is them, right? The joke is on them. Right? Um, and it also is really clearly inspiring anger and hatred at Jews who are supposedly not really doing their bit for the war. They're supposedly not doing heroic events. Instead, they're profiting from the war themselves. Um, so Jewish defense organizations protest the publication of this poem. And the military responds. The military issues directives that they need to stop publishing the First American in all of their newsletters to avoid criticizing members of racial, religious, or ethnic groups. They punish individuals who use military equipment to, to type or mimeograph the poem. So the federal government responds and they say, no, you can't put this poem out. But it's still, you know, the military actually responds to AJC representatives saying, oh no, this is just a joke, right? This is, you know, we didn't mean anything by this. It's not intended to be offensive. Um, because it used names, right? Rather than coming out and saying the Jews are profiteering, right? By using the name Abraham Lipschitz, the, the, the message gets across um, but there's no actual attack on Jews, and it allows people to sort of say, no, this isn't really anti-Semitic, and so it makes it a particularly effective piece of propaganda that lasts throughout the war. Um, oral histories, memoirs, and literature from soldiers in World War II also emphasize the use of Jewish names as sources of discrimination, ridicule, and sometimes badges of contempt from officers as well as fellow soldiers. So one Jewish soldier wrote after the war, Quote, I spoke with many Jewish boys at the camp who told me that the reason they never got appointments to officer candidate school was because their name or nose was not Aryan, um, the German term for sort of not Jewish. Another Jewish soldier noted that he, like many others, had encountered, quote, army officers who had been so ignorant as to make derisive remarks about a Jewish sounding name. No matter what the name, if it smacks as Jew of Jewishness, then it's funny. Jewish names were targets for ridicule and humor, and they were used as markers to enable discrimination against Jews. And I have one other poem that I won't go into in great detail, but it's worth noting that it's not only, if we're talking a little bit about gender, it's worth noting that um, it is not only last names, right? So you can see the first lines of this is um, where are all his other friends. This is a poem about America's Fighting Jew, and it's Saul and Abe and Moe. They're making tailor uniforms for those who have to go. Remember Jake and Sidley, how Sidney had greatly been talk of how we should get Hitler and bring him to New York, but Jake is now ensconced and he is in charge of immigration. Um, and Sidney is getting funds to care for refugees that swarm within our border with jingoistic pleas, which has no resonance at all yeah. today. Um, so you can see the ways that it is not only Jewish last names, and you can see at the end of this, they use the name Bernstein. Um, those are Jewish last names, but they're also Jewish first names that are seen as Jewish first names, Saul and Abe and Mo. Names that have sometimes biblical resonance, but also sometimes are sort of um, uh, sort of um, just names that Jews chose, like Sydney, for example, has no biblical resonance, but it was a name that a lot of Jews chose at this time, and it became known as kind of a Jewish name. Um, so um, you can see the way that if these things work, that these kinds of names are used, and they come out as sort of vaudevillian humor, but they're clearly being weaponized in this particular way as a form of propaganda against Jews. Um, and, and it's the humor and the ridicule, right, that allows for this kind of double meaning. Um, so the 1940s are not the only era during which Jewish names are used as targets for, for bigoted vitriol. 
Um, and World War II is not the only war in which the government used names as symbols of American diversity and democracy. You see this in World War I too. I'd be curious if you see the, the prejudice against those names too in World War I, but you certainly see posters that use names in similar, similar ways. But what I think is really interesting and important about World War II um, is that at the precise, it's at the precise moment that Americans are using this discourse, right? They're using these Jewish names, right, to talk about difference and diversity, right, in these really strong ways. Those names are taking on less practical meaning because so many Jews are changing their names in response to this kind of hatred. So the numbers of New Yorkers officially changing their names skyrocketed during the years of World War II. <coughs> um, throughout the 1930s, the numbers of name change petitions to New York Municipal Court were roughly 250 a year. In 1940, they doubled to 664, more than doubled. And they climbed throughout the war to the 800 and then 1,000. By 1946, it's 1,127 name change petitions submitted um, in one year, um, four times the average of the previous decade. And the largest number of name changing petitions in one year in Manhattan for the entire 20th century. Right, so you the numbers aren't so important as to know that this is sort of a massive upswing in name changing. Um, and those petitions come from people of all different ethnic backgrounds, but they, a large percentage of them are identifiably Jewish names, far out of proportion to the Jewish population. So even though Jews are about 25 to 30% of New Yorkers, they're a very, very high percentage of New Yorkers, they're the, they're the largest white ethnic group in New York um, at this time, However, they represent um, far more than that, about 50% of the entire pool, and it's actually even less. These people should really only be about 15% because it's only Manhattan that's being represented. So they are far, they're roughly six times what their population is. They're being, they're way over what accounted for. Um, and no other ethnic group came close to Jews, right? Um, so other groups are, are taking, are changing their names, but like, so in 1942, the total number of petitions submitted by people with Slavic, German, Italian, and Greek names was about a half of the petitions of Jews altogether, right? So all of those four groups together represent about a half of the name changers that Jews are. So it's really noticeable that so many people are changing their name and really that so many Jews are changing their name at this time. And so um, that really leads to kind of two questions that I'm gonna explore. Um, the first is that it's, it's clear that the war is leading people to change their names officially, but why? Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that why. Um, and then the second reason is why, and why in general the war, and then why specifically Jews? And what does that mean about racial and ethnic identity? Um, so the first question is why such an, an enormous trend just towards official name changing most generally? Um, World War I is actually usually the war that's associated, if you like remember back to high school, right? World War I is usually associated with name changing of all getting rid of German names, right? So people change the names of, you know, Frankfurters to hot dogs and, you know, sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage and street names are changed. Um, and so it would make sense that getting rid of the German language would mean that World War I would be the one that is associated with, with um, changing names. And it is true that numbers of name changes do go up, they double during World War I but they don't quadruple. Mm -hmm. um, and the names that are being changed even during World War I in New York City are mostly Jewish, they're not German. Um, and even though German and Jewish names are intertwined, they are nonetheless Jewish German names. They are not just regular standard German names. Um, and so why, why? Why would it be more World War II than World War I? Um, so part of the reason is that the US is in the war longer than the First World War, right? They're in there for double the amount of time, so there's more time for people to sort of be experiencing discrimination, to be sort of experiencing the pressures of the war, but I think it goes deeper than that. Um, World War II comes at a time when the state, when the government, is expanding its reach into level, into places that it had not reached before. The passage of the Social Security Act, the draft, um, uh, the GI Bill of 1944, are ways that the government is interest, is, is um, penetrating ordinary individuals' lives, is coming into people's lives um, and making them think anew about the ways they identify themselves. Um, the government becomes much more concerned with individuals' needs. Um, throughout much of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, Americans' attitudes towards names was 
flexible. And this is especially hard to understand for us, I think, in 21st century America, when your name, you know, needs to match on all documents. And, you know, when my kid's name was spelled wrong and his passport, we had to go get it fixed. And, you know, there's a huge attention to these kinds of things. That was not the case in the 19th and the early 20th century. It is really things like the Social Security Act and the GI Bill, places where people begin to look at people's names that make people think, wow, I really have to go and officially get my name changed. Um, in fact, you don't have to officially change your name. Interesting fact, if you want to call yourself something else, you can just call yourself something else, and you can pretty much go by that for 10 years, and you will not be legally charged, but you also may not get your checks cashed, right? Like, you may have trouble bureaucratically, but you can still do it by law. So the fact that these people are all doing this by law <coughs> means that they are concerned about the government, they are wanting jobs, they are wanting to participate in the war, and in order to do so, they have to change their names to match what, what their other documents say. Um, so petitions for name changes at the New York City Civil Court, for example, are filled by a large number of individuals who are applying to work in defense industries as well as in the war. Um, and they're consistently reporting that they need, they want to change their names officially because they have unofficially changed them years ago. Um, but they can't get a job. The defense industries begin in the 30s to say you need a birth certificate if you want to get a job. And so they can't get jobs unless they can have their birth certificates match their job applications. Um, so I have tons and tons of applications that sort of say this, or petitions that say these kinds of things. So here's just one. In view of the fact that I intend to register on February 16th, 1942 for selective service, I do not wish for there to be any confusion with respect to my identity. Stated Saul Jack, Jack, Saul Jack Kaufman, excuse me, in his 1942 petition to change his name legally to Jack K. That was a name he'd used in business and social relations for over 20 years, right? And he decides to change it officially at this moment because he wants to join the war. A good number of individuals actually reported being specifically counseled by senior military officials um, or by government bureaucrats um, to change their names officially. So saying, you know, this isn't gonna work. Go, go do something about this. We're happy to take you in the Navy, but first go, go take care of your, your name. It's also worth noting, and this is in part response to Jessica and also sort of in thinking about gender, it is not just male soldiers and it's not just male workers who are changing their names. Women also want to work in the defense industries or as civil servants. I haven't found a lot of um, evidence of women who want to be wax or waves like there were in the film last night, um, but there are certainly women like Laura Ginsburg um, who puts in her petition, petitioner has been known by the name proposed Laura Gale for the past seven years both socially and with her employers. Petitioner is about to apply for employment by the United States government, and said application has to be accompanied by a birth certificate. Petitioner has been employed by the United States Naval Air Base at Bermuda under the name proposed, and because of the war, cannot return back. <coughs> so you can see this sort of, like, she's been using this name, it's gotten her jobs as a secretary to be Laura Gale instead of Laura Ginsburg, right? That sounds better. Um, but professionally, uh, excuse me, and actually officially, yeah. Officially, she needs to have this new name. Um, and it's worth noting that popular literature of the era emphasized the impact, right? So people are noticing this, right? They're beginning to really pay attention to names because they notice that the government bureaucracy is paying attention to names. So people who insisted upon using nicknames rather than their birth certificate names were fighting with endless bureaucracy in the military. Um, one, one writer for Colliers noted, another editorial tells parents to name their children wisely because names on birth certificates show the appellation, quote, the appellation by which you will be known in all your official relationships, including those with the government, and particularly the army. Um, one of the only books written on name changing at this time, uh, Louis Adamich um, wrote What's Your Name in 1942, and he writes in his preface that it's because of the wartime bureaucracy that he's written his book. For about two years now, he writes, particularly since Pearl Harbor, we as individuals have been lining up and registering and reporting for all sorts of things. We are filling out all sorts of forms, applications, questionnaires, statements, depositions. We are required to show birth certificates and other documents attesting to our beginnings. Right and left, we are being asked, what's your name? The bureaucracy of World War II thus directed individuals' attention to names more intensely than ever before and led many people to legalize the name changes that they previously considered just a matter of, matter of personal choice. And so bureaucracy is a really important and I think underexplored reason for, you know, we tend to think about 
needs is just our names, and you don't think about the ways that those actually are the ways the government identifies you and takes you and gets your taxes and, and uses you. And so there's a large part of the way that that becomes very visible to people in World War II, and it pushes these name changes. So bureaucracy is a part of the story, but it's not the whole story. Um, the large number of Jews applying to change their names suggests that there is there are other reasons. Name change petitions offer testimony to the impact of wartime nationalism, um, as individuals continually ask to change their foreign-sounding names, and that's the quote that, that all of them use, um, and they want instead more American names. Um, and this is particularly, or excuse me, it, it is true of names that are German or Italian, right? Those are our enemies at the time, right? That's the, those are the Axis powers, the German and, and Italians um, that, are, that are in the United States. Um, and those are the names that reflect the enemy. But it's also worth noting that people want to change their names even when they're um, identified with um, our allies, right? So people, Jews with Polish sounding names or Jews with Russian sounding names are also wanting to change their names as well. Um, Jews tended in general, and this is I think why they keep saying foreign sounding um, rather than saying Jewish, they tend to be hesitant to dwell on their experiences with anti semitism um, they prefer to focus on the foreignness of their names. They describe their names as handicaps or impediments. Those are quotations. Um, it's very legalistic language, but it's really telling. Um, Milton Lefkowitz's petition to change his name to Martin Milton Lewis, for example, insisted that his Jewish name, Lefkowitz, was Hungarian in origin. It is not Hungarian in origin. It is a Jewish name. Um, while Solomon Goldfarb, in his petition to change his name to Saul Robert Guilford, explained that his name was a handicap in his current profession of engineering, that he was engaged to be married, and that, quote, I desire that any offspring of my marriage shall not labor under the handicap of going through life with a name such as Goldfarb. This is an, an unfortunate situation of the world we live in, but it is a situation not of my making, and I feel that we must face reality. This actually makes me really sad when I read this quotation, um, because, you know, this is, and, and he is not alone. Um, uh, this is, he is, he is really anxious about sort of the, the ways that names can be a handicap. Um, some petitioners did openly describe their fears or their experiences of discrimination in the army as a result of their names. Eugene Martin Greenberg petitioned to change his name to Eugene Martin Grant because he believed that, quote, while with the U.S. military forces, his career will be more successful and he may ultimately secure merited advancement on legal assumption of said proposed surname. He's clearly echoing what he's heard. You're not gonna get, you're not gonna get promoted in the military. He insisted that he did not intend to, quote, forsake the Hebrew religion of his family. He's one of the very few petitioners who actually use the name, the words Hebrew or Jewish to describe himself or his fears of discrimination. There was another, this is also a really sad petition. Um, in his petition to change his name to Ellis Beal, petitioner Elias Beagleman, a Jew who was born in Riga, Latvia, and grew up in Brooklyn poignantly described the discrimination he had faced in the army, um, uh, although he, he says that his persecution resulted from the Germanic rather than the Jewish nature of his name. Um, during your petitioner's recent service in the military forces, he found that his name, because of its Germanic or Teutonic sound um, and connotation, was decidedly prejudicial to him. Because of the intense anti-German feeling in the army, there is a tendency to shun, avoid, or perhaps not fraternize or mingle with anybody suspected of German. This, of course, had a depressing feeling upon him, since the most important influence in keeping up the morale of the soldier is to make friends and to be intimate with his friends. So name change petitions, I think, offer us um, uncomfortable evidence of the ways that ethnic difference, and particularly Jewish difference, engendered much prejudice during World War II, and so much prejudice that Americans work to erase their differences entirely, um, and shed any vestiges of their background or past, at least um, and I want to point out that these, these recent petitioners especially sort of focus on men and the military, but it is really worth noting, as I've described, Laura Ginsburg is a story of women in defense industries, and even more so women in <coughs> families. And this is something that's frequently forgotten about name changing, but it's really worth thinking about. So Solomon Goldfarb, number one, made his decision as he got married, right, as he's thinking about getting married and having children, which also lets you know his wife is going to take on this name, and his kid is going to take on this name, whether it's a male or a female child. And so even one man changing name is generally going to reflect, you know, women and, ch and female children as well who are going to have those names. Um, so it really helps you to see the way that gender plays a role in name changing. And actually, during the war, 
in the 20s and 30s, you see sort of a continuing in the 40s. Um, it is still performed primarily by men, name changing. Roughly 65% of the name change petitions were filed by men um, and 35% by women um, throughout the war. Right? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, but nonetheless, you ha we can't ignore that women enthusiastically participate in the name changing. So 35% of them are doing so either as um, for their own jobs, for their own work world, or as wise. By 1946, 30% of name changers were veterans. So a large number of people were people in the war who experienced the kinds of things that I talked about. Um, and another 10% were their wives, right? So this is a significant number of Jewish veterans and their wives and Jewish families um, who are changing their names. And it's worth noting that the war is a watershed. After the war, by 1947, name changing becomes actually 50-50, much closer to 50. So I think that what you see more women in the workforce and you see more people who are sort of more thinking this is a, more of a family activity that we can participate in. Um, so even as the government insists upon names as reflections of national diversity and democracy, um, its own state expansion um, encourages individuals with ethnic names to change them, to conform to a more American standard, an Anglo-Saxon, I don't know, unidentified. The bureaucracy of the war and growing concern with national and personal identity created an atmosphere in which both women and men who had seen their names as personal matters and casual matters um, become compelled to change those names in order to fight for the country. Um, scholars um, have emphasized the ways that World War II integrated white soldiers of European ancestry, made them white, included them in white troops like Bataan, right, sort of everybody's equal, they're all white soldiers, they're all Americans, by forcing them to work in military units to see one another as comrades and brothers, very much like the film that we watched yesterday. And this form of integration is not available to African American soldiers, um, and so the historians have, have rightly pointed that out. But I think that name changing um, complicates this portrait. Um, integrating Jews into white military units does force some non-Jewish soldiers to recognize their humanity, and the government's propaganda focus on diverse European names sends out a message, right, of equality and tolerance, right, it tries, right, to say, it's not okay to make fun of Jewish names, and we do need to include Jewish and Catholic names as American names. Um, and it is ignoring the more profound racial discrimination that is faced by African Americans and Asian Americans in the war. But the fact that large numbers of Jewish men and women at this time faced anti-Semitism in the military, and that some chose to escape it or mitigate its effects by changing their names and effectively effacing their Jewish identities from public view, suggests that the process of integration was not as simple as these historians have initially suggested. The casual and widespread targeting of Jewish names as humorous, open to ridicule, sometimes subject to discrimination in military settings, pushed many Jews to become particularly sensitive to their names as badges of Jewishness, um, and led some to hide those badges entirely. Um, simply having white skin and working with white troops did not make Jews white. The negative attention heaped on those names led many to believe that they needed to erase them all together in order to become um, some Jews thus integrated into white American military forces as a result of coerced conformity, I think, rather than democratic inclusion or white inclusion. Yeah, Dan, I close something over. Sorry. Okay. All right. Anyway. Thank you. Thank
thank you guys for being here. Um, and my talk is going to look at uh, women rabbis and the struggle to become military chaplains. It will draw, I think, nicely on um, the two talks before me. So I want to start, this is an image of a chaplain, Bonnie Koppel, who when she was early in her seminary training to become a rabbi, had noticed a military recruiting poster and set her sights on becoming an army chaplain. Her effort to enlist as an army chaplain, that is to voluntarily enter the military um, as a clergy person, would become, as she later recalled, a major political battle. And as you can see from this image, she, she triumphs. She does become an army chaplain, but her ultimate success doesn't erase the long and protracted battle she faced in order to enter the armed forces. Nor does the image, which in many ways is emblematic of a success story of a female rabbi serving her country and her people or her religion, it also doesn't capture the friction and tension unleashed by her desire to voluntarily enter the armed forces. And in fact, that major political battle, which for Koppel occurred within the Jewish community, also um, highlights the ways in which the opportunity for women to enter the chaplaincy stood on a much longer political and religious battle for women from a lot of faiths. And today I'm going to talk about both of these major political battles, the battle for women to enter the chaplaincy in general, and the battle for Jewish women to enter the chaplaincy as rabbis. And together these battles really unveil certain fault lines that are otherwise somewhat masked. Now I want to go back for a moment to World War I, which Jessica talked about, um, and actually the moment of uh, Jews entering the chaplaincy, which um, occurs during World War I through the efforts of both Cyrus Adler, who's representing the Jewish Welfare Board, which you heard about, um, as well as Representative Isaac Siegel, who's a, a representative from New York. They tussle back and forth, both amongst themselves and with Congress and the military, and the War Department and the Navy, about getting Jewish chaplains in. And it is this bill introduced in Congress, what becomes referred to as the Chaplains at Large Bill, which passes six months after the US enters the war, which as you can see, allows for what are called Chaplains at Large from Jewish, Christian Science, Eastern Catholic, or Eastern Orthodox, Mormon, and Salvation Army denominations. And I point this out now because when I later get to the question of women chaplains, it's also going to apply to a range of faiths, not just to Jews. And for Jews though, once this passes, there's this question then of who do you send to the military? And as we talked about earlier, there is of course a desire from the Jewish Welfare Board, which is a set of men, their committee on chaplains, also all men, to pick sort of the very best representatives of American Judaism, of rabbis. They have to be rabbis um, in order to serve. Um, and, it, and it turns out that it, for, during World War I, it's only gonna be reform and conservative rabbis because the military has certain requirements, education requirements and ordination requirements that they meet. And again, these requirements are gonna become central to the fight later over women as chaplains too, that these are deemed sort of just neutral requirements, standards the military uses to make sure they're getting well-trained clergy. And so you do get ultimately 25 um, American Jewish chaplains. And as you can see, the rabbis, like all the other clergy in World War I, were men. Um, here they are getting trained to become chaplains. And this sets off a process, certainly, of, um, of Jews being and of rabbis being chaplains, which is a really important landmark itself. And again, as was talked about a little bit, it also creates this opportunity to focus on the ways Judaism, like other religions, can inculcate manhood. Um, in the interwar years in 1923, it's Morris Lazaron, who's a reform rabbi and a reserve chaplain who becomes the most prominent spokesperson for this view. He speaks at a 1923 conference on uh, religion and morals in the army. He gives the plenary address. He is chosen. Um, to give this address called Religion for American Manhood, and he's making this case that religion, including Judaism, is fundamental to masculinity, to manhood. Um, he talks about the ways that the, the intimacy of the barracks um, is a space of brotherhood, um, and the ways in which everyone starts, he, he offers a very universalizing and optimistic vision of how this is gonna bring together everyone of all races, of all creeds, of all nations together, um, and he outlines the ways in which this commitment to non-sectarian religion is going to actually um, improve these notions of masculinity. He is um, he's really quite central to 
um, articulating this vision, which had been bubbling around and had been articulated by a lot of people, but this is coming from a War Department conference and really pushed out, it's printed, it's circulated. Um, and it is a, a Jewish chaplain who's articulating it, arguing that, that Judaism, like Protestantism and Catholicism, is part of this work. And this becomes, during World War II, we just talked about and just saw, there becomes these new um, ways in which, again, military service stands in for masculinity. One of the ways this happens is through a radio show called Chaplain Jim, um, which is, uh, which the first episode has like the roll call of ethnic surnames, like this is such a common trope. Um, but the thing that's really interesting about Chaplain Jim is it's also a testament to the ways in which the military, although it's not necessarily employing, it's certainly not at all employing women as chaplains, is very actually attentive to women, but in a sort of outsider or peripheral, peripheral way. So actually this radio show was written to assuage women on the home front, and it, it was designed to show how the chaplains were helping their sons, husbands, brothers, male friends, anyone they knew, um, work together. And uh, it does this work very explicitly. The beginning and end of every show talks about how they are addressing women. At the end, it talks about writing letters to their sons and husbands. So it is, for, the, 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 the story is really, the challenge in itself is written like a soap opera, it's a radio serial. But like the beginning and end is like, we're talking to women. I mean, there is, this is not hidden at all. It is right there, this recognition that women on the home front matter. But there are also women who want to serve in the military. And World War II is a moment in which numbers increase. The military recognizes a tremendous role and a need for women to serve. So you start to have women entering the service. They weren't comfortable just being on the home front. Um, and this massive mobilization really creates a, an opportunity for a deeper and more sweeping recognition of women's military effectiveness. At the same time as that hundreds of thousands of women wore the uniform and served in all combat theaters and worked at jobs um, at sea, on land, in the air, they also, women also they were also restricted to certain occupational specialties in the military, primarily in communications, nursing, and clerical support. But there were movements afoot for women who wanted to do more. And so this is an, an example. It's actually a Christian scientist, um, a woman who's, who's in the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, who is stationed at Fort Des Moines, and she writes to her to the Christian Science Board of Directors saying she wants to become a chaplain. So she is really the first woman to say, I see this role, and actually she makes this case for why she'd be really good at it. She like, talks to women already, she organizes them already, she provides these worship opportunities. Then she's, she argues to them that, right, in this case, that she could be of greater use to the Christian science movement as a chaplain. She thinks she's heard the gossip saying that there were women um, preparing to become chaplains. This isn't true at all. <laughs> I don't know, you know, right? This was a rumor circulating. There's no evidence for this. And uh, the Christian scientists, they respond to her by being like, well, we'll, we'll talk to the military, but they kind of know this isn't going to go anywhere. And the military responds, not surprisingly, in a sort of like, mm, women, chaplains, nope. <laughs> like, they're like, this has not been thought about at all. We don't plan to think about it. Absolutely not. So it is tabled, but it is, I, I point this out just to, to note that it's women who actually request this initially and the military completely ignores them and thinks this is silly, this is like frivolous, and of course women wouldn't be chaplains. It's notable, of course, that at this time there aren't very many religions. Christian science is unique in that it does have women in leadership positions. It's religion founded by a woman. But nevertheless, it takes about 30 years um, and um, Elmo Zumwalt, who's chief of naval operations, um, decides that part of his work is going to be um, increasing um, diversity and equal opportunity in the Navy. As chief of naval operations, he sets policy. And he issues his policy memos as what he calls Z-grams. <laughs> They're all, you can see all of them. The Navy has, has a really, um, the Navy Archives actually has done a really great job. They're all online. He does a lot of work with race, um, uh, eliminating racial discrimination as well, but the big one for our purposes is equal opportunities and rights for women in the Navy. And it's really important because, and he is an interesting character himself. He, he served in Vietnam, he becomes Chief of Naval Operations. He's quoted in Playboy in 1974 as saying, people don't know basically what to do with me if I'm like a bleeding heart liberal or like a famed military zealot because he's both been in Vietnam but also is 
is really pushing for women's inclusion. And so he specifically says that um, he thinks the military can do uh, significantly more and giving them equal opportunity to contribute their extensive talents and to achieve full professional status. This is in uh, 1972. This is August 1972. And then specifically, he says we're taking the following actions and he is going to accept all applications from women officers with a chaplain and civil engineer and corps, thereby, thereby opening all staff for women. So there will still be lingering questions about women in combat roles and other positions, but all staff positions will be open to women. And so <coughs> he is really responsible for pretty single-handedly opening the chaplaincy to women. The first woman to become a chaplain is Diana Pullman, who is a Presbyterian, um, who becomes who was commissioned in 1973, um, and she is she had an uneven experience. You know, she it was something she wanted to do. Chaplains are always enter the military voluntarily, but um, her experience was like, like those of many uh, women to enter, enter this space um, were, were not always good. She generally found Catholic chaplains easier to work with, she conjectured, because they were used to working with nuns, um, and Protestants much more difficult. Um, and at the same time, there is evidence both from um, the troops and sort of from memos and surveys that rank and file troops were actually pretty open to having women at service chaplains, but there was, quote, some reluctance by other, by some older male chaplains to accept women professionally. So military culture could both impose this change, but also culturally take its time to accept women. But the issue is, as I, as I said earlier, in order to become a chaplain, you had to have a bachelor's degree from an accredited university, as well as ordination, um, and then ecclesiastical endorsement, which is to say a religious body had to say, yep, you can go to the military, you're sort of good at, at what you do. And in 1970, and really throughout the 1970s, um, women constituted about 3% of American clergy. So you don't have a lot of women on which to draw. Um, and, and not all denominations ordain women, and this was the case um, for uh, Jews, which uh, created this question. Um, certainly in 1970, there were no female rabbis, though there were a couple in rabbinical school. Um, but basically, there was no major denomination that was graduating more, uh, or any major religion that was graduating more than about nine female clergy a year. So again, the pool is very small. It is, however, in the early 1970s that uh, two movements within Judaism begin to ordain women. So on the left, you see Sally Prezant, who becomes the first uh, female rabbi in the United States, and she's ordained by Hebrew Union College, the Reform Seminary, in 1972. And then Sandy Eisenberg Sasso, and I feel like my left and right are mixed up, yeah. totally mixed up. My, I think they were originally the opposite, uh, whatever. I don't know how that happened, they're mixed up. Um, <laughs> is ordained by the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in 1974. But basically, so in 1974, you got not, like not exactly a big pool of women rabbis to choose from. And, um, and meanwhile, uh, John O'Connor, who's a Catholic, becomes the Navy Chief of Chaplains in 1975. And he, after Zumwalt issues his memo in, in 1972, there becomes a like, and also like now you actually need to do it. Like you've got a, you have like one chaplain. There's by this time one female army chaplain, an African American, a woman from the AME Church. Um, but it was like actually we got to get our numbers up. So O'Connor, who's a Catholic, um, and no nuns can ever serve as chaplains because they can't administer the sacraments, so they can't fill the duties of a chaplain. The Catholic Church was never going to sanction that. Nevertheless. He becomes responsible in the Navy for finding women to serve. And so he sends a letter, and I think this is an interesting moment just in terms of thinking about role responsibilities. He is a male Catholic priest who sends a letter to every religious group that endorses chaplains to the military, basically saying, we need women, and we need women to serve. He sends it to his own church, he sends it to the Mormon church, he sends it to every group, including the Jewish Welfare Board, um, and saying, saying that he, uh, and it's a really interesting letter. It's a form letter, right? He writes it and sends it to every group, and he insists he's not being alarmist, but he urged faith groups to aggressively recruit women, and this was an issue of equity, he writes, both in their careers and to keep religions equal, to keep religions equal in the United States and in the military. He needs women from all of them. Again, even though there's no way his own church is ever going to send him women. 
um, and that this is, he claims, um, that you know, equal opportunity without regard to race or sex is a reality quickly coming into sharp focus. The implications for ministry under that concept is an opportunity to be grasped, a service to be rendered. And so he was really dangling this out as like, what a great opportunity, like basically ordain more women and send them to me. Um, so, so this starts to happen, it happens very slowly. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, it's groups that already had ordained women or had women leaders who were the most, um, the, the quickest. So uh, Janet Horton, who is a Christian scientist, is one of the earliest um, career female military chaplains. Um, and others also, there were a lot of African American women who served because the AME and, uh, and National Baptist churches ordained um, African American women. But the first uh, Jewish woman who, again, is interested in serving is Bonnie Koppel. And her experience is uh, really quite important, not just to the experience of uh, Jewish uh, women, but to the question questions around Jews and the military and internal community issues. Because when she saw that recruiting poster, she knew she would have to convince the JWB, the Jewish Welfare Board, to endorse her. And at that time, the chaplain's committee consisted of reform, conservative, and orthodox rabbis who did approve rabbi, they, they collectively approved and endorsed the rabbis. So there was, that did mean that, you know, the reform rabbis who were part of this committee were saying okay to the orthodox rabbis, the orthodox rabbis were saying okay to conservative rabbis, they kind of built this um, agreement in which they wouldn't get in the way of sort of one another's um, ordination requirements or understanding of what Judaism was, they would do it collectively. There, but she was actually coming out, she was a Reconstructionist rabbi coming out of the Reconstructionist movement, so there were no Reconstructionist rabbis on this board, and she really didn't know what they, how they would react to her as both a Reconstructionist rabbi and as a woman. And um, this was at a moment, this is in uh, the late 1970s, um, you know, there were no, certainly, uh, this is right as the conservative movement was debating and sort of in these days of very heady debates about the question of women's ordination. The reform rabbis, she expected to support her and she expected some resistance from the orthodox rabbis. Um, to her surprise, the JWB, she was then in rabbinical school, so she wasn't yet ready to be a chaplain, but there were these programs for people in the seminary that they could start, um, they could do some of their training with the military early kind of get in. And so to her surprise, actually, the JWB supported her candidacy, candidacy to enter this sort of preliminary training to do the chaplain's officer's basic course. And she was one of four Jews and three women in a class of 108, who was the only Jewish woman. And um, she talked about the ways that, you know, it wasn't really for her in that experience, it was the 4 a.m. wake-up calls, the marching, and the uniform requirements that were much harder to deal with than um, being a woman or being a Jew. So she was ready. She was, you know, intended to graduate from seminary and enter the army as a chaplain. But in 1980, on the verge of accepting her commission as a chaplain, like she was ready, paperwork, sign, sign up. Um, she, that's when she encountered the opposition and resistance she had expected earlier. Um, what should have been a pro forma shuffling of paperwork, she recalled, became a major political battle between the reform and orthodox factions of the Jewish Welfare Board's Chaplains Committee, and all she could do was wait. She basically needed a signature from them. Like she'd done the course, she was trained, she was ready to go, she'd been ordained, um, but she needed their signature. And this was a march to nowhere because she waited in limbo, um, ticking off days, weeks, and then years, wondering what would happen. And it took seven years of equivocating um, before the JWB signs off on the paperwork and Koppel became an army chaplain more than 10 years after seeing that first recruiting poster. But actually her experience, she got that signature um, in a sort of roundabout way, which is to say that as she was going through this process and waiting, there were other women who were seeking to become chaplains as well. And um, the reform rabbis who were part of this committee felt that the orthodox rabbis were just really getting in the way and separating and polarizing the Jewish community um, because they were blocking, they were signing off on the papers of male rabbis from any movement, but not the women. And the, for the reform rabbis and the reform movement, this orthodox block sort of stank of double standards in which they call mutual respect and equality that had long characterized the work of being willing to endorse one another's um, rabbis 
um, was evaporating because of women and not because of other issues between the groups. And it was actually not, it was actually a different woman rabbi who raised this most explicitly is Julie Schwartz who wanted to enter the Navy. Um, and this is even reported in the New York Times, the issue of women as rabbis breaks up Jewish unit and Jewish unit there is actually the Jewish Welfare Board. Um, that Julie Schwartz, who wanted to enter the Navy with her, her husband was also a rabbi, they were going to enter together, and she really pushes that Koppel had taken a civilian pulpit and was like, still wanted to do it, but was kind of waiting patiently, and Schwartz was like, nope, we need to get this going. And, um, and so at this point, and this is now in the early 1980s, the military is seeking you know, additional female chaplains, um, and the Orthodox rabbis asserted that, um, that, that once the, the reform movement basically said, fine, we'll do this on our own. So if the JWB is not going to do it, we're going to just, we'll sign the paperwork. And they sign it for Julie Schwartz and then for um, uh, Bonnie Cockwell. And this, the, the Orthodox rabbis then feel like the reform movement had like snuck one over them and was trying to um, uh, dilute or otherwise polarize the group. For Schwartz, um, she thought that this was um, wrong-headed because um, she wasn't, much like the military itself, she wasn't trying to change their beliefs, she just wanted to serve, and she felt this was well in line with the way the chaplaincy more generally worked, which is that chaplains served everyone, regardless of religious background. That's what she was trying to do, and, and she didn't want the Orthodox getting in the way. She thought this was sort of a middle ground position. You can endorse me as a chaplain, which says nothing about in women rabbis more generally, but for the Orthodox, that was too much. So what had been about 70, 60, 70 years of cooperation falls apart with the question of women rabbis. And um, after this point, each um, movement actually endorses uh, their own rabbinical candidates through the JWB, but not collectively as the JWB. So you do start to get more women rabbis as chaplains. Uh, Hannah Timoner is a really interesting case in the 1990s. She was also, again, as you can see, waiting <laughs> There's a lot of waiting for women. She becomes a rabbi fairly late in life, um, at age 41. Uh, or she becomes a rabbi at 38 and at 41 becomes a military chaplain serving at Fort Bragg. And she's a battalion chaplain serving six to 700 soldiers from many different backgrounds. And she's an interesting example of the importance not just of women in this position, but also of liberal Jewish rabbis because she uh, becomes a chaplain right as uh, President Clinton announces the military's don't ask, don't help, don't tell policy, which allows gays and le gay and lesbian soldiers to serve if they stay closeted. Um, but clergy were often, because of clergy privilege and confidentiality, were sometimes the only people that might have known that someone was uh, was closeted. And she announced very publicly that she would counsel um, gay soldiers. So she she sort of made herself available and open for gay soldiers. Um, and just as a final note, this is Chaplain Heather Borshoff, who's currently a chaplain at Fort, uh, Fort Belvoir in Virginia. Um, she served with the Wounded Warrior Battalion, um, and I, she t I, I uh, talked to her last year, and she noted that she actually has no Jewish soldiers in her battalion. At Fort Belvoir, she provides the Jewish services for the rest of Fort Belvoir. But so it's this interesting dual role that Jewish chaplains have long played of both being the person to provide support for Jewish families, Jewish soldiers, but potentially assigned to battalions or units that don't have any Jews in them. And that's a role that she has found actually quite satisfying. She again talked about how being a reform rabbi has meant that soldiers that were resistant to other clergy found her open and inclusive and really came knocking even as um, she wasn't, you know, they weren't Jewish at all, but, you know, her office had a line out the door. Um, it wasn't an issue. Um, so finally, I just want to note that in the past few years, there's been a real celebration of the 40, and now we're moving on to 45 years of women, women in the chaplaincy. It's rarely told as a Jewish story, um, but in part, um, Jews have won the interesting, um, dimension of Jewish women entering the chaplaincy has been they've, they've stood on battles that were fought by many others, but it's created this own tension within the Jewish community and a splintering that had not, that had been able to be papered over, that the differences within the Jewish community were, were less important um, or could be worked around, and the question of women rabbis really uh, decimated that illusion. Questions. Um, 
So, questions for our three uh, fabulous presenters today. I was interested that uh, when you spoke um, about the kind of almost creating a new masculinity for um, uh, Jewish men, and of course, um, from my own background, you think of the Zionist image of um, kind of creating a new person with the masculinity and the army and the military, and I'm less familiar with that in the American context, and it seems like there were differences in terms of the role of religion that they play in the establishment of a new man um, in Israel. So that seemed like a difference, and the difference in terms of the marriage part. But other than that, it was kind of some curious similarities um, that possibly going on in similar times yeah. um, that I hadn't really previously thought about much, and I don't know if you want to you know, speak to that. Or... Yeah, no, I think you're right to point to the similarities. In fact, um, Sarah Imhoff has written mm -hmm. about sort of Zionism and sort of the, the creation of a sort of Jewish masculine image and the way Zionism figures into that discourse mm -hmm. as well. And I think you're right to notice, right, the, uh, particularly in this case, and I think in her work as well, religion is a big part of that staying attached and leaving the Jewish, Jewish religious communities in some fashion, um, rather than agricultural working going after the pioneer. Um, but military service in both cases, particularly around World War I, becomes really important um, to ideas about masculinity, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a good citizen. And so as the country is going to war, there's almost no way to work around that. You have to be thinking. It seems like, I don't know, just a quick follow, that yeah. they're, in each case, they would be primarily influenced from their own particular context um, rather than influencing each other. But I'm wondering about the latter as well, as to what extent, I don't know, you know, they're influencing one another, even though the prime motivation seems to be an internal nationalistic one that, that, that's framed by the nationalism in the particular context. You mean transnationally across? Like yeah, I mean fr power. from from the ideas of like this um, uh, forming a new man, a new masculinity, whether th there was any kind of influence on one another, and I've never really thought about it much, but it kind of strikes me, even though it seems my, my gut reaction, this not being my uh, area, would be um, that it wasn't primarily that, that it was nurtured in a particular context of a place separately, but, to, but I'm kind of curious to what it's that they may have their points on it. I mean, I, I can hear you guys as well, but I was kind of saying both mm -hmm. and, right, that the Zionist movement is, right, Louis Brandeis is leading the Zionist movement in the United States, right? It's not like they are entirely separate mm -hmm. phenomena. I agree, there's so, there's something different going on uh, among, you know, Halutim in uh, Palestine at that time, but discourse about, um, what Jewish nationalism can mean for the revitalization, particularly of Jewish men and Jewish men's identity as citizens and as sort of proud bearers of Jewish masculine identity. That, I, I think there's a good deal of crossover in, in lots of different contexts, U.S., um, right, in, before the war, European discourse, and then um, carrying over into what's going on in Palestine as well. But I, I would think there's probably a good deal of crossover, even though I agree that there are distinct national contexts um, right, and with the war, thinking about what is the demand of your country is, is very, very central. Um, I've been kind of working on an article about uh, recruiting men for the Jewish Legion, that will, the Jewish battalion that will serve in Palestine under the British flag. They come to the United States to recruit, right? And that's like a crisis for the JWP. What are they going to do <laughs> well, while they're promoting these images of men as brave Jewish soldiers, and then they get this opportunity to go serve in a different national army? Right, that, that's a real conflict there, wrestling. How do, you, how do you make that work? Yeah, I would just add that um, I think, yeah, there, those links absolutely exist. And then, you know, someone like Morris Lazaron, who becomes a mm -hmm. pretty well known anti Zionist in the right. late 1930s, would be like, absolutely not. Right. You know, I'm like, I'm like, this is totally separate. This is American. This isn't about Zionism. So they're, they're going to be kind of a diverse set of voices. And But speaking, it's interesting with the Jewish Legion because there is evidence from. Um, World War II soldiers in Italy, like after the Allies succeed in Italy, and there are these like you know clubs, like like for soldiers' recreation and whatnot. Um, and when the British and American Jewish soldiers encounter 
you know, what they refer to as the Palestinian soldiers, which is to say the soldiers from Palestine fighting for the British, they're actually like very annoyed with them. Mm-hmm. They're like, they can't because they speak a different language and they like they just find them like annoying and culturally different and like they're mostly just frustrated. So I mean it's one small example, but it, it and it's again it's, I think like again the same impulses are happening in both mm-hmm. places, but actual encounters like yeah. suggest that it didn't necessarily operate kind of maybe in the same the ways that someone might have envisioned it as a larger. <laughs> So I have a, a question that I'll, I'll lead into with a short story if you'll forgive me. So I remember being a very young and talking to my grandmother about her experience during the Blitz in, in the UK. And I said to her, she was caught up in a lot of bombing raids and a, a big city that was bombed very heavily. Um, and I said, you know, was it terrifying? Was it horrible? And she said, are you kidding? It was the best years of my life. I was 20, my parents before the war would like basically had me chaperoned all the time. I had no freedom. Whereas do you know I got to go to work if the if the bomb sirens uh, sounded and we all went into the shelter, we had a great big party all night, right? Um, and she, her experience of the war was actually something that was incredibly liberating. Mm-hmm. And I think this is one of the one of the dominant ways, um, one of the sort of dominant narratives that we um, that we have heard about the experience of of war in that in some senses it's actually very liberating. It's been liberating for women, right? It's given opportunities for um, for sort of travel, travel and sort of global cultural exploration to people who might not have had access to those things. It's given people access to um, to, to people that they might not have encountered before. And so there is um, there is a certain uh, there's a certain sort of narrative um, that we can use to tell the story of um, of, of war and World War One, World War Two, particularly, which is actually actually a story of, of liberation and, and, and what participation in, uh, in, in the military um, can, can do to expand someone's horizons. But the story that I heard all of you telling was a story of barriers, right? And so as was stories of how, um, in different ways, the, the, the military showed sort of um, barriers that, that, had to be, that had to be overcome, um, which I think is a really interesting corrective to, to that narrative. And I'm, I'm wondering for, for the subjects of your research, how they um, did they experience that tension? Did they they, they experience sort of barriers in some places and possibilities for sort of liberation and expansion on their horizons in, in other places? Do you do you, do you see that sort of push and push and pull for the people who feature in your research? Yeah. Sure. Can go in order. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of my research for this project focused on sort of the history of an institution. Right, so these were men who weren't necessarily partying in the bomb shelters. Or whatever, <laughs> like they were the, the guys up and down. They did not like a party. No one is cool um, as my grandma. No, that's true. Um, so I think this, what I see them is um, pushing boundaries and then having to work within the boundaries that are established. Mm-hmm. Right, so the Jewish Welfare Board does, I argue, right, manage to push the government and the country's boundaries a little bit in terms of what they think is. Legitimate, a legitimate expression of religion, what is a legitimate American religion, um, but then they have to work within the parameters uh, that they've managed to carve out. The, the government remains the sort of major and most powerful player in, uh, in any relationship they can have with the military and with the soldiers. Um, where I do sort of encounter voices of soldiers themselves, yeah, they, they are sort of broadening their horizons um, in ways similar to the voices we heard in the film last night where they, Jacob Rader Marcus's diary is fantastic, right? He, he was this rabbinical student, very studious young man, uh, and he gets sent down to a military base in the South. And he's like, oh, my, this is a vision of America that he had never seen before. He encounters people he never would have crossed paths with. Um, he has a new understanding of how race and racism functions in the United States based on being in the Southern military base that he clearly had never understood as being part of uh, American society before. So I, I don't know that I would say it's freedom, but it's um, encountering new understanding of where the boundaries are of American society. So expanding in some ways, um, but working with it. Yeah. Um, so for my people, um, you know, I only have these petitions, right? So I don't have as much, but I do, the, the nicest thing that I have, I, I think they're experiencing weirdness is the way I would say, right? I mean, you 
go into a barrack and you don't know what you're going to encounter, right? And so sometimes you do encounter, you know, somebody saying something anti-Semitic about a name, right? And you encounter, you know, anti-Semitic comments from other soldiers, but you also might make friends, right? Um, so I think there's, they're trying to navigate those things and trying to figure out, and names can be a way that they, they feel like they can navigate, I think. But, I, it, you know, what your, your story made me think about, so there's a really famous essay on name changing that gets published after the war um, where, by a guy who remains anonymous. He actually like, writes an essay that becomes a really popular essay about changing, his, I, I changed my name, and it's written by anonymous. So he wouldn't say what his new name is, right? He wouldn't say his old name either. Um, and he says, you know, he changed his name, he gives all the reasons for changing his name, but it starts with his brother, who had just, grabbed, who had just um, left the Navy, but it started with his brother was in the military, maybe it wasn't the Navy, but in the military, and he starts getting these strange letters from his brother that have different names, like kind of crossed out, like he's trying on new names <laughs> as he's writing the thing. And the, he says, you know, the military gave him a taste for travel and cosmopolitanism, you know, it gave him a taste for seeing and doing new things and wanting to go to new posts and not be burdened by the name that he has, right? So there are ways that people see these names as, as tying them down in this new environment, mm -hmm. right? And it, it's a way that they, can, that they can navigate easily. A lot of times they're not trying to avoid being Jewish. It actually, it's, it's liberating, but it's not abandoning Jewishness. It's like, ooh, I can go somewhere and people won't know what I am, right? I can still be whoever I am. I can try on new things. Right, trying a new identity, I think, is a way without kind of abandoning way, and it's, it's just a name for the outside. So, yes and no, like, it's kind of like that. Like there's boundaries, but then they're exploring within the boundaries. I think is a really good way to describe it. Yeah, I would echo that. I mean, a lot of certainly in World War One and World War Two. I mean, the chap. I was actually when I was researching was really skeptical initially. Like when I was like reading these chaplains, like extolling the virtues of the chaplains, like, not necessarily the military writ large. But the chaplaincy itself and the opportunities for it, I was like, what is this? Like, this is like saccharine. This is like, this, this, and it doesn't comport with what we know about the rest of American society at the time. But I actually was convinced by it, like, that the chaplaincy itself, absolutely imperfect, was definitely like not always sure footed in how it handled religious difference, but did create just, I think for clergy especially, it created these opportunities for contact with other clergy that they just didn't have in civilian life, and by World War II, Roland Gittleson, who serves as a chaplain, he's most famous for giving the sermon um, after Iwo Jima, and it ends up being this like separate memorial service, and I think this comes up in the, the film. But you know, he talks about when he goes to, to Navy Chaplain School, which at the time was at um, the College of William and Mary, and the military very deliberately housed, so chaplains are housed in dorm rooms and housed with with men from other faiths. So like this was a very intentional logic experiment. And he talked about how incredible and intellectually vibrant and exciting it was that you know before he was in the military, 90% of his contact was with Jews and other rabbis. And then through the military, he suddenly like just the contact with people of other faiths like changed, like really changed him. And you can tell actually with the rest of his career this is true. And so by the time women are entering this space, that part is sort of taken for granted. Like, of course you'll work together with people of other faiths. And it's actually why so many of the women, I think, come back to like, this was really like meaningful service for them. And that the rank and file were really open to that. It was, it was really the question of being a woman that like, especially for the Jewish Welfare Board, and it's not actually exclusive to the Jewish Welfare Board, this becomes a major issue for the Southern Baptists as well, and some, there are some other groups where this also is like a real fight. Um, some groups are like just absolutely not, so there's nothing to discuss. Some groups are like, we already ordained women, so of course, and then it's, these, it's, it's Jews and a few other groups where this is like a really contested space. Um, and I think kind of just one last point in terms of both like when the government sort of sets the boundaries, which is definitely what's happening in the chaplaincy, those like minimum requirements for, for ed like education requirements really end up playing a role. Even to this day, there's this debate over, so like um, nuns or, or, um, or Muslim women who want to serve, but, or even Orthodox women, like, like um, a maharat, like it would really raise all these questions, like would have to be approved because of the endorsement both the like ordination requirements, does that count as ordination? And and like you needing the endorsement of the civilian organization mean 
but it kind of actually creates these interesting fights because the government is dangling this op sort of opportunity for those who see it as you know a compelling way to do work, but because it still requires the sanction of your like home religious body, these people who actually like want this role kind of face this difficulty. And at the same time, for religions that if they do care about the recognition that comes with being in a chaplaincy, it actually does create an incentive for them to kind of, like this was very true for Southern Baptists when there was a whole big debate in the early 2000s and then again in 2011 over like pulling the ordination for women. And at the time, it's a Southern Baptist, a Southern Baptist woman is the chief of chaplains for the VA. And people are like, um, by the way, you lose that if you strip women of this. And so this question, kind of this real back and forth over this is an opportunity, it creates an incentive, but for some religious groups, it's, that's not enough of an incentive. So it's real back and forth. I guess I have a question on the, uh, the topic of the name changing in World War II. What do you think uh, accounts for the, the disproportion in name changing the, the you know, for Jewish people over uh, name changing other uh, ethnic or minority groups? Oh, um, so it's uh, <laughs> it's anti-Semitism. It's it's anti-Semitism mixed with um, upward mobility. Um, so Jews are doing this at a particular moment in a particular. Um, space where they are middle class, but they want to be more middle class, right? Or they want to sort of firm up their, their role in the middle class. Um, and they are facing more and more restrictions. They are facing more and more people who they do not want Jews in the middle class. And so actually, in these college applications, which are now in the news because of Harvard, that those systems begin with Jews. And it, it is, you can feel differently about sort of what's going on now in terms of um, this legal suit. But, those, those systems are put into place to keep out Jews. And they do things like ask, has anybody changed your name and your family like on the application? Because they are they both are really interested in keeping out Jews, and they know Jews change their names to be able to get into colleges as forms of upper mobility. So as Jews are trying to get these jobs and get into schools to help them sort of expand their middle class, they are literally facing application restrictions. They, they are facing the creation of a system that is designed to look at their names and, and keep them out because of their names and or their name changing. Um, so it is that kind of bond between their success and also efforts to limit and, and restrict that success. So uh, as a follow-up, I mean, there, mm -hmm. there, I guess it's feasibly uh, discrimination against other groups too. Um, is it just focused not so much on on uh, principle of name, more so on appearance or something? Sure, like right, so exactly. And so that's why, and so the court, the, I didn't go into it as much in this, but part of my emphasis on the names, I mean, I, I think that there's a tendency, I have noticed this in my own life, and I show it in the, in the piece, um, to sort of regard Jewish names as funny, right? They're just inherently funny. Like, I, I have received fellowships that were called like Glowenstein fellowships, and people would laugh at them, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's a fun, you know, like, um, and that I think is discriminating. Like that actually is a, it's a form of it. It's you know whatever. It's not anti-Semitism itself. But these names were names that Jews took on that nobody else had. Jews got last names later than other people um, in in Eastern and Central Europe. They they took on those names later. They had very dis distinctive names really, that marked them as different. And that was sometimes intentional in Europe. They were not allowed to change their names in parts of Europe, right? Or they could only take on certain names, right? Because people were worried about them integrating too well. And um, so part of the discrimination against Jews was indeed a linguistic one, and it was an unmasked, it was focused on their names. And so, and particularly in the United States, because discrimination is based on skin color, right, and sort of, you know, the way people look. And that certainly happened with Jews as well. There were features, there were physical features, and, and you know, college applications also began asking for photographs. Right, and those were being used to keep out African Americans for sure, but there were fewer African Americans looking to get into college because they didn't have the means to be able to pay for those schools. So there were fewer of those. So photographs would absolutely get rid of African Americans, um, but they were they were looking for Jewish physical features, but they were using applications to identify elements of Jewishness that they believed were sort of marked who they were. And so names really became um, not just badges of you know, Jewishness, but they were literally used as kind of the, the mark of who a Jew was and, and a, a form and a basis for discrimination. Thank you. Yeah, sure.
Um, to kind of go off of the name changing and then kind of in the broader sense, the kind of cultural immersion into the, of the American identity, did you find, and this may have been beyond the scope of your research, um, and you touched on it briefly, but kind of the loss of a Jewish identity um, through this kind of becoming American in a, in a vague sense? I don't know, should I answer or do you start? I can start. I mean, so one of the large arguments of my book is that I don't think it's a loss of Jewish identity. And I did talk about this because I think that there's a strong assumption and a tendency to believe that it is a loss of Jewish identity. And I guess I'm in part writing my book against that. That is not to say that some people who changed their names didn't, I mean, some people did. I found petitions of people who were converting. I, you know, I found petitions from people who were clearly, or, or you know, you find written works from that guy who said, I, I've changed my name, who says, you know, I really don't have any connection to the Jewish faith. I, I care as little about a dying Jew as I do about a dying Hindu. You know, really, like, I am, that is not me. And so there are people who are doing that. Um, but the, the majority of them are not. The majority of them are staying within the Jewish community. And, you know, it's funny that I will still have arguments with people about this, but I'll say, like, you know, the most religious person in my synagogue has a changed name. His father changed his name from Rabinowitz to Raber, right? Um, that that is like the, you can find that in pretty much every synagogue in America. It's not everybody, but um, there's a lot of ways that people are doing this to get by. They're not doing it to stop being Jewish. They're doing it because they're actually being concretely um, restricted from opportunities that they want. And so it is to them uh, the most, the easiest way, and it's, it's encouraged really by the government, it's so easy to do. And, and so you don't have to event for Jews anyway, like passing for African Americans is a totally different thing, right? But for Jews, there, there is this kind of easy accessibility to be able to, I use the word covering, like to be able to sort of cover your Jewishness and keep it private and be publicly, you know, somebody else, something easy, but it doesn't abandon, it doesn't include an abandonment or a loss. But they don't know it. No, I, I would absolutely agree. I don't think that the, the of people that I'm looking at are interested in, I think they're actually very interested in um, deepening commitment to Jewish identity and Jewish community. I think the restriction that they're working against implicitly isn't about, you know, restrictive covenants and housing or whatever. It's, um, it's immigration restrictions. Mm -hmm. That they know that the country is growing increasingly hostile to immigrants. Uh, we passed the massive new anti-immigration immigration restrictions in 1917. And so a group like the Jewish Welfare Board is working to shape a form of Jewish identity that they hope will be deeply Jewish, but that will be acceptable to the government and to their non-Jewish neighbors and countrymen. Um, and I think, not entirely, but in part that is because of the anxiety um, that new Jewish immigrants, new immigrants are, are unwelcome in the country and they have to, they want to put an Americanized version of Jewishness forward uh, via the military sort of to the country at large. Um, so I, I, I think very much that it's about protecting uh, a Jewish identity, but an appropriately Ameri what they feel is an appropriately Americanized form of that identity, less Jews become unwelcome. Okay. And in your example, from our talk, I don't know if I heard you correctly, that you were saying um, that if they had an accent, right, or if they, right, you had all these other things uh, to back up who they would take in. Yeah. And it was partially based on name, but more linguistic than name. So for yeah. what you're saying, it's more the immigrant, prejudice against immigrants. Yeah. And I think you're saying it's more, you know, anti it's, it's They're always combined in these instances, but, but and fold into each other, but it's more than anti-Semitism than the prejudice against immigrants. Well, the fact right. is that it's, this is years later. It's right. after that immigration right. restriction right. has right. already passed. And right. so these are mostly, and that's the other irony about them saying their names are foreign. These are seventy-five percent of them are born in America. Yeah, right. None of them are immigrants, right? Yeah. They're they're all American-born, but they're being made to feel like they are foreigners. And going back to the the uh, policies for appointing chaplains, right? So you have to be ordained in an institution that the United States government recognizes, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's already going to be um, kind of anti-immigrant sense. If you are a rabbi but you're ordained in Europe, the United States government doesn't recognize your. Is that right? uh, that's why you have no order. Well, and I mean, there are other things, but it is the real, like, I mean, people sort of accuse the JWB of being anti-Orthodox in this moment, but it's actually that Orthodox rabbis can't meet the military's requirements, and, 
And it's not until you have enough graduates from Wakabishi University to like actually really yeah. meet the requirements that you can have Orthodox rabbis serve. So yeah, it's, I mean, that, I, mean I think that's really one of the, to me, one of the really fascinating mm -hmm. things about, and the government set that parameter not with the Jews no, in mind. No, no, no. Like that had nothing to do with Jews. It was just, it was actually used as a proxy for toleration. Like mm -hmm. it was the assumption of the US government, we could debate whether this was accurate or not, was that you wanted college graduates who were ordained because they were more well educated and thus more likely to be sort of work fluidly with other religions. And this, like, if you actually look at American religion at large, it's, it's actually, it may not be totally accurate, but it's also not inaccurate. Like, given the, like, rate, given that, like, there are a number of different, I mean, right, so Jews and Catholics actually get privileged in this system right. because in order to be rabbis and priests, you have to be educated, whereas there are a lot of Protestant groups where you're just, you know, you, you sort of have a vision, you have a calling, you are now a preacher. And it was really an effort to weed out that group more than anything else. But it just happens then to catch the Orthodox right. and even that mm -hmm. then. Thanks, yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious, in part just because of what I've been having to read lately, with the gender roles between, like specifically in the military and the chaplaincy, like, you would talk about how um, it had begun as almost social engineering to shape the male image um, to kind of, I don't know, put, a, put some kind of like God's seal of approval on this is what a man should be kind of thing and take that across the borders of all the religions. So then when you introduce women to the scenario where now they're, you know, they're fighting and they're moving up and they're gaining position in their religions and, and they're stepping into these positions, um, how did that affect the images of like the gender image within that if that was its, the chaplaincy's main goal was to say this is what a man is. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> 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 it's a fantastic yeah. question. Um, so one thing that's interesting is that at least culturally, so chaplains are kind of an interesting group within the military because they're they kind of at least reputationally can be seen either as these like right in like enforcers or um, these models of this sort of uh, hyper macho masculine world, or they were seen because they, you know, chaplains by international law are non-combatants, they don't carry weapons, are seen as sort of emasculated, feminized people. So like there's actually a lot of back and forth with like chaplains as to like which way they go. And there's a lot of fear, if you look at the trajectory of women in the military more broadly, there is long a concern about like what are they, what is the presence of women going to do? So even after World War II, um, when by law um, women are allowed to enlist, they can still only be two percent of the entire enlisted personnel, only ten percent of the officer corps. Like there are these very clear limits placed on their service in the 1970s when Zumwalt and others are opening the military to more women. There's still these questions about like caps and quotas and do they serve in their own sort of segregated units. It's not actually until the late 19, it's not until 1978 that all units are basically gender like gender integrated and, and combat isn't open to women until 2015, even as women are in combat position, like are actually dying on the front lines, but not officially in combat roles. So, you know, they're, and they, they're often actually what happens, particularly in the more recent past, is women become the trainers. So like they can't serve as combat pilots, but they train the combat pilots. So there's like this interesting then movement on like, what does it mean? These questions of masculinity or femininity, because what does it mean if like your combat trainer, your combat pilot trainer is a woman, but she can't actually serve on a mission? It almost mirrors the experience within, a, within at least religions that I've looked at where the women can like fulfill these duties to a point, and then all of a sudden, I mean, it took forever in some religions Judaism to be be able to even ordain a woman yeah. um, and other religions like give a little more freedom to women as far as like serving and, and doing things but ordination still took forever so it sounds like I mean when you put it that way just the trajectory of women in the military it sounds very I mean I keep thinking yeah. of G.I. Jane like they're <laughs> having to the same fight 
to just say, I want to be in this field, I want to be in this arena, I want to be taken seriously, and I want the same responsibilities. Absolutely. No, I think you're right to observe <coughs> these are, in, although the military and religion can be seen as very different institutions, that yeah. actually, if you look at the role of women in each of them, they're, yeah. they're a fairly similar trajectory. Um, any final questions? Yeah. 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 Yeah.